faculty lectures, I don't prepare a uh, written introduction, but I thought that for the person who's speaking today and the topic, he proposed that I needed to do that. Our speaker graduated uh, with a Bachelor of Architecture degree from the University of Oklahoma. He graduated with a Master of Architecture degree at the University of Minnesota. He taught at Minnesota as a graduate assistant. And then he uh, has practiced uh, in New York City and other places. He uh, has taught, before he came here the last few years, at Clemson University. <coughs> Excuse me. He came here a year and a half ago to assume the role of the first regular chairman of the Department of Architecture. He's uniquely qualified to speak on the role of photosynthesis in the poetry of nine Renaissance Alaskan ophthalmologists during the period 1650 to 1661 and other topics of interest. Please notice that when I introduced him, I said that he came here to assume the role of chairman of the Department of Architecture. He is an accomplished role player. He's especially good at photosynthesis. I don't know whether you had the opportunity to see much of his architecture, but he's been a very uh, accomplished person at the synthesis of photos from the best journals. His work thereby gains its two-dimensional quality in the same way that the printed words of poetry come forth. He speaks on ophthalmologists very appropriately in connection with his own work, for ophthalmologists also deal with diseases of the eye. The dates of 1650 to 1661 are, the dates of 1650 to 1661 are curious ones for Renaissance men, but perhaps his delivery will be equally uh, curious. Finally, it is good to know that his presentation will include, and I quote, other topics of interest, for we do indeed look forward to those other topics. <laughs> I'd like to give you today the original, one of the original Renaissance specialists in other topics, uh, Professor Kenneth Carpenter. Uh, thank you. Dean Saffenfield for that eloquent introduction. I would like to make two corrections, if I could. First, the spelling of ophthalmologist is O-P-H-T-H-A-L-M-O-L-O-G-I-S-T, and the plural is at an S, which Professor Rosenman has to the rear there for anyone that... <coughs> Secondly, no... No. That was indicated on your title. An ophthalmologist, not to be confused with an ophthalmologist, which is not what we were intending at all, is a person that has uh, explored and discovered the relationship between the armpit and the posterior. <laughs> 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 the scientific nomenclature. As you say, if you use the term ophthalmologist correctly, that's the one that can well, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the second correction is that there is a rumor around school behind my back that what happened is Marvin came to me and said, could you do something for these lectures? And I said, yeah, but what? And he said, well, show some of your houses in South Carolina and a trip to Russia or wherever and just give it a catchy title. But it's absolutely not true. And I'll try to show you through these slides this afternoon how this is a very serious study. I think simply by uh, synthesizing the information from these diverse sorts of slides, photo, if you will, Charlie, thank you, you can gain really great insight from these ophthalmologists. The group is primarily an architectural group, so I've tried to orient it towards the architectural implications. 
Poetry, of course, is almost synonymous with music and tempo, so it's not surprising that some of the first example of architectural influence occur in buildings that have um, sort of bridged this gap through music and through tempo in frequently in fast service sort of buildings. Uh, I underline the word bridging. It will be important to the de development of my entire thesis this afternoon. And with that, I'll turn to some slides. Kim, if you could give us the first I'll get them here. Yeah, thanks. OK. Musical forms of this in the architectural world first came to my attention in this structure. Obviously bridges this gap between poetry with music, deals with the conflict of temporal and spiritual sorts of things. <laughs> <coughs> there are several others that I'll go through rather quickly here. As you know, Robert Venturi has really made a study of this, and he has categorized these things into what he calls ducks and glorified sheds. Now, Venturi thought, because he did a very superficial study, that this was the origin. He really never got back to the poetry that I have dealt with, and consequently I don't think you can fault him too much for the study. But the thing that he missed that was critical is that these Alaskan poets were very much involved with the water and with the birth that the water gives. And he really did miss out on a lot of structures that are closely related to that. <laughs> this, this brought me somewhere to the end, or at least I thought, to the end of my study. <coughs> And it was actually, now, Kim, if we could have the other two trays. I, I really didn't, in my practice, realize that there was much influence in the early work, which was primary. So I'll try to get a focus for you. Can you focus that left one, Kim? Can you focus the left one? Okay. Really wasn't until we got into some buildings, residential buildings on lakes, that I realized that our residential work was exactly in line with these ophthalmologists' <coughs> poetry, and that it was, in fact, bridging this gap between land and water. And consequently, you will see lots of bridge forms. water forms as well, and the fountains. At one point, we decided to depart from the bridge form and start dealing with the wall. Actually, it was a blind alley, if you will, and we found that even subconsciously we were coming back to bridge forms, in this case an inverted.